Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be a little bit lower key than our <laughs> MC. I hope that is OK. Um, so as you heard, I've spent the past 45 years uh, studying doctor-patient communication. It's mostly been on the doctor side. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to train more than 25,000 physicians across the United States and in Western Europe. And in that time, we have come up with some research findings which we think apply equally well to patients as to physicians. So what I'd like to talk about today are some strategies that you as patients or spouses of patients or friends of patients can use to optimize the time that you spend with your provider. So I'm told that this has sound, and I hope it does. We're always having this talk. You're not getting what you need from this guy. How long have you been seeing him now? It'll be six years in January. Six years? It's a long time. I mean, you got to tell him how you're feeling. It's not healthy. No, I know. It's just that he's very busy. But if only he would listen to me and really Jed. hear me. Jed, it is time for you to see other doctors. You're right. Yeah. I know. Thank you. Thanks. Well, when I put this together, I realized it's two women talking at a conference on testicular cancer, but hopefully you get the point. All right, so I want to take you through a very brief history, um, three eras in medical care. So the first era really is up until the 1950s, and this is a picture of Dr. Ernest Siriani. He was the inspiration for Dr. Kildare, Kildare, Dr. Welby, and he appeared in a photo essay in Life magazine, 1947. This was a time when uh, physicians were self-sacrificing, often lived in the communities in which they grew up. They were self-employed, they had high status, and they were self-policing. And we go from 1947 to 1986 in this cover of Time magazine, which pits physicians against patients in terms of things like medical malpractice. Let's see if this works. So this is a time when we um, found out that the quality of care varied greatly by where you lived, what your income was, what your race was. Um, it was a time when we found out that physicians who own their own laboratories um, did significantly more testing of patients than physicians who didn't own their laboratories. So we're beginning to see an era where we're um, trusting but verifying. Uh, and um, healthcare organizations begin to reward uh, high quality care and disincentivize poor quality care. We then moved to 2002, the Institute of Medicine in a off-cited, often cited report called Crossing the Quality Chasm, defines patient-centered and relationship-centered care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. This is really important because this is the first time that a national organization recognizes the importance of communication in the doctor-patient relationship and how it affects outcomes of care. So in the late 90s, a colleague of mine from Kaiser Permanente and I um, reviewed the world's literature on doctor-patient communication. We came up uh, with something called the Four Habits of Highly Effective Clinicians. And we looked at the literature in four different areas, opening the encounter, eliciting the patient's perspective, which is not something that many doctors uh, have great skill in, demonstrating empathy, another area where there's great opportunity for improvement, and then completing the encounter, which involves also making sure that the patient understands what you've told them and is able to repeat it back to you. So let me just take you through um, the 
first habit, which is investing in the beginning and setting an agenda for the visit. So here's a patient. Uh, doctor says, hello, Mr. Jones, what problems are you having? Patient, I have uh, pain in my abdomen. When did it begin? And this is a classic interruptive statement because it doesn't allow the patient to say that they've got more than a single concern. It started about three months ago. Is it a sharp pain or a dull pain? Dull. Does it radiate to other parts of your body? Have you taken any medications for it? No. So you can see here, there's also a shaping of the answers from a full sentence to just bits, yes, no, yes, no. On the other hand, you might have an opening like this. Hello, Mr. Jones, what problems are you having? I'm having pain in my abdomen. And in a great show of restraint, the doctor says, uh-huh. <laughs> it's an achy sort of pain. Uh-huh. I've also noticed some swelling here. He points to his groin area. And a bump here he points to his neck. I see. It's really frightening. Doctor, before we talk about these concerns in detail, is there anything else you'd like me to know about? And the answer, no. So now we have what we might characterize as a complete agenda. And we have much more information, not only technical information, but emotional information. It's really scary. Now, it turns out that physicians who are trained in this model really don't take any longer to complete their visits than the first type of physician who's interrupting and asking pointed questions right away. So how well do we do at agenda setting? This is a very old study. It was done in 1993. We took 100 patients with diabetes who were 60 years or older. And we asked them after their visit how many concerns they had that they wanted to share with their physician. On average, they had three concerns. 70% of the time, they never got past the first concern. And once they announced their first concern, it was only rarely that they raised additional concerns. And when they did, it was at the very, very end of the visit. So, oh, by the way, doc, I've been feeling sad and blue lately and like life isn't worth living. Now, if you're gonna stay on time, you've got 30 seconds to deal with that concern. Wouldn't it be better if you knew about that concern right at the beginning so that you could deal with it? So we don't do very well uh, in agenda setting. My wife is a clinical psychologist, and she did a study of psychiatrists' agenda setting. Out of 100 visits that she looked at, there wasn't a single completed opening using open-ended elicitations. All right, so this is all interesting, maybe. It's interesting to me as a, as a nerd. Um, but is it possible to change a physician's behavior? So this is a small study that we did. It's based on a three-hour intervention with physicians who had low patient experience scores in the Hill Group in San Francisco. And what we did was teach them one skill, which was agenda setting. And based on three hours, their patient experience scores, with one exception, all improved significantly. I actually got a letter from an ophthalmologist who said, I've been practicing ophthalmology for 25 years. And in the space of three hours, you changed the way in which I practice medicine. I now elicit all of my patients' concerns at the beginning of the visit so I know what I'm dealing with. Thank you for that. So here are four simple things you can do to prep that's an acronym for your doctor's visit. The first one is, maybe sounds a little bit silly, but it's preparing for the visit. You know, when you fly someplace, the pilots in the cockpit have to do a pre-flight checklist. They have to go through uh, a preparation before they can ever take off. So here, 
preparing for the visit, you might wanna write down your concerns, write them down in the order of importance to you, and we'll come back to that. And when you get there, ask for your concerns to be placed into the medical record because then that becomes a legal document. You might also want to rehearse. Oh, so let me show you how this might work. So remember the interrupted opening. I have pain in my abdomen. Where did it begin? Here is something that you could do as a patient in agenda setting if your doctor doesn't do it. Hello, Mr. Jones, what problems are you having? I have pain in my abdomen. Doctor, when did it begin? It started three months ago, but it's only one of three problems I'd like to discuss with you today. I'm gonna to say that again. It's only one of three problems that I wanna discuss with you today. So respectfully saying, I can answer your question, but there are some other things that I want to discuss will almost always result in um, your having the agenda that you want. And remember the study of the older diabetic patients, th the average was three concerns. The most important concern for these patients was their third concern. And 70% of the time, they never got to that most important concern. So it's really important to prioritize your concerns and put first what's most important to you. So um, I think it's really helpful to, to uh, rehearse. Your doctor in a practice lifetime is gonna rehearse 140 to 160,000 times. They're gonna know pretty much what they're doing and how they want the visit to go. So you can practice, practice with a spouse, practice with a friend, a child, um, whomever, and have them interrupt you so that you can practice the skill of saying, well, wait a minute, um, what, this is what I need. We know from a series of studies that was done from the 1980s onward, that patients who ask more questions may be seen by their doctors as a pain in the ass. They also have much better medical outcomes, both psychosocial and biomedical outcomes. So don't be afraid to ask questions. In our case, since we were studying older patients, there's a belief that older patients um, simply do whatever their doctor says. But if you listen to their conversations after the visit, they're gonna say things like, you know, I never got to say what was really important to me. So uh, engaging by asking questions, I think is a really uh, useful thing to do. And then finally, um, Persevere. If you don't understand what the doctor has told you, you can ask for clarification. So we know that under routine conditions, patients remember 50% of what was said. If there's bad news or there's a distressful, uh, it's a distressful encounter, that number goes down. So invite your doctor to do a talk back. A talk back or a teach back is used in aviation, it's used in nuclear power to make sure that what gets said is uh, what's intended and what's said is understood. And I'm gonna show you an example of a teach back. Watch out! Something very important, all right? Okay. 
I want you to run home, and I want you to call the ER of North Bank General Hospital, 932-1000. Tell them to set up OR6 immediately and contact anesthesiologist Isadora Turek, 472-2112, beep 12. Have them send an ambulance with a paramedic crew, light IV, D5 and W, KBO. You got it? ER North Bank General Hospital, 932-1000, set OR6 contact. Anesthesiologist Isadora Turek, 472-2112, beep 12. I'm being able to do it with Paramux and Lavi, D5 and WKVL. That's good. Sounds like a subdural hematoma to me. Oh, it does, does it? Well, it's not your job to diagnose. But I thought... You thought, you thought, just go! Three years of nursery school and you think you know it all, but you're still wet behind the ears. It's not a subdural hematoma, it's epidural. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good example of a teach back or a talk back. If you don't understand or there's some question in your mind, invite your physician to restate what he or she has just said and then restate it yourself so that you can commit it to memory. So the four things, once again, are prepare. Think about what you want to get out of the visit before you step into the room. Write down your concerns. Write them down in order of their importance. Make the first thing the most important thing. Rehearse. I'm sure you rehearsed a, a dozen times before you stood up here and, and introduced. <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Engage. In, um, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid that you're wasting your provider's time. It's your time with the provider. Make it your time with the provider. And persist. Be uh, persist. Ask for more information if you need it. Uh, and I think those four things that we teach on the physician side are things that you can use on the patient side. Once again, what we have found in our research is visits where patients are prepped actually take no longer. And in the studies where patients ask more questions, this wasn't part of their published work, but um, personal communication with the um, the principal investigator, they actually found that the visits where patients got coaching for 20 minutes before they saw their uh, provider took less time than the standard visits. They were afraid that it was too controversial a finding to actually publish it. So with that... Watch out! <laughs> be confident, be yourself. Presume welcome and positive intent on the part of your provider. Be a good partner. You know, we're in such a divided country right now. Being a good partner is one of the best things that you can do. Uh, don't be afraid to offer constructive feedback. It's the only way your physician can improve. I, um, two weeks ago, we're seeing an ophthalmologist who was an hour late and I was sitting in the exam room for an hour, and this person came in and said, um, sorry for the delay, no explanation for why. And then he said, how are we doing today? And at the end of the visit, I said, would it be okay if I gave you some constructive feedback? <laughs> and he said, yeah. I said, well, first of all, your apology was a classic non-apology apology. Sorry, I'm late. Okay, but that doesn't say why you're late or what you intend to do not to be late next time. And then I said, and who is the we in the room? I, I did, was unaware that there was more than one of me in the room. We is used as the royal we. And from a patient perspective, that just doesn't work for me. And he was actually, um, he said, that's really helpful feedback. Nobody 
really gives me feedback that way. So don't be afraid to give constructive feedback, but do it respectfully and do it constructively. And with that, I'll say thanks for your time.